Good morning, friends. I greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How good it is to be together with you this morning, whether video or in person, that we might share together in Christ the King Sunday, declaring together the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We are invited into this time to worship with gladness. The psalmist says this in Psalm 100, Shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with celebration. Come before him with shouts of joy. Know that the Lord is God. He made us. We belong to him. We are his people, the sheep of his own pasture. Enter his gates with thanks. Enter his courtyards with praise. Thank him. Bless his name because the Lord is good. His loyal love lasts forever. His faithfulness lasts generation after generation. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love this day in the life of the church. It is not ecumenically noted as being a season that marks church calendar. That will be soon. In fact, it's coming very quickly that we begin Advent and then Epiphany and Lent and beyond. But I'm grateful for the season of Thanksgiving. I know that doesn't make it under too many calendars as a season. In fact, we think of it often only as one day. But as the people of God who declare that Christ truly is the King, there is something to be said about us living in a season of thanks, to give God thanks and praise. But the radical issue in this is that we would not just simply say that with our lips on one day or maybe even three or four or, or six or seven or eight or who knows how many. It is that you and I would also live that Christ is the King. What does that mean for you and I? It means that we have to make sure that when we declare that Jesus is the King, that we're not just then moving on ourselves to our own lordship in our own lives, being the ones who determine the rules, being the ones who make the demands, being the ones who live as though we are the final authority. And for those of us who maybe perhaps have utilized our experiences of life as something that only contains us or binds us or punishes us, that that is, even in and of itself, a bit of a, a kind of kingship or a lordship in our lives, where when Jesus declares grace and mercy, we hold it at arm's length, maybe not so much in the moment where we will sometimes receive thanks and grace, but where we often will take and run back to a place in which we think we're just unworthy and we somehow seem to fit into our lives solutions that are really not God's design or God's best for us. And even then, we take the lordship and the kingship once again upon our own shoulders and upon our own selves. The beauty of today is an opportunity to remember and to recall that Christ is king. And not just to say it and to rehearse that with our lips, but to live as those kind of people, receiving the discipline that sometimes comes in a season like this, letting the world around us teach us and speak to us about ways in which we maybe have been living in the middle of some sort of privilege where we were acting as if we were the king. Maybe not necessarily with our brothers and sisters, but maybe with our brothers and sisters in this world. Maybe it's the relationship we have with God and the ways in which we have made demands and expected God to do things the way we thought they should be done. And we've gotten mad or we've lost faith because God didn't do it the way we wanted it done. Or maybe because we have taken and assumed that while we don't see something as being offensive or difficult for another person, that they should also see it the same way. That then is a place of our own privilege, a place of our own need to grow in humility as Christ humbled himself among us. As such, it draws me to an Old Testament reading that we have in Ezekiel chapter 34. I want to look at Ezekiel 34 verses 11 through 16 and then jump over to 20 through 24. And like that psalm passage that I read a few moments ago, I'm going to be reading from the Common English Bible. And I would invite you to follow along with me in your Bible if you can. Ezekiel chapter 34. I know Ezekiel is a bit hard to find in the Bible, but I'll give you a minute to get there. Ezekiel 34 verses 11 through 16. And then we'll jump over to verses 20 through 24. Ezekiel 34, 11 through 16, 20 through 24. It begins this way. The Lord God proclaims, I myself will search for my flock and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out the flock when some in the flock have been scattered, so will I seek out my flock. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered during the time of clouds and thick darkness. 
I will gather and lead them out from the countries and peoples, and I will bring them to their own fertile land. I will feed them on Israel's highlands, along the riverbeds, and in all the inhabited places. I will feed them in good pasture, and their sheepfold will be there on Israel's lofty highlands. On Israel's highlands they will lie down in a secure fold and feed on green pastures. I myself will feed my flock and make them lie down. This is what the Lord God says. I will seek out the lost, bring back the strays, bind up the wounded, and strengthen the weak. But the fat and strong I will destroy, because I will tend my sheep with justice. So the Lord God proclaims to them, I will judge between the fat and the lean sheep. You shove with shoulder and flank, and with your horns you ram all the weak sheep until you've scattered them outside. But I will rescue my flock so that they will never again be prey. I will even judge between the sheep. I will appoint for them a single shepherd, and he will feed them. My servant David will feed them. He will be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be their prince. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love that part of this text where it reminds us of what Christ is about to do among the people of God. God will seek out the lost, bring back the strays, bind up the wounded, and strengthen the weak. And it's not just the people of God that we assume to be within the walls of the church, those who have keenly declared that they are servants of the Most High God but all people. In fact, the message to the people of God is that they should be careful that they should not be the ones who have taken power and shoved with shoulder and flank, with horns rammed all the weak sheep, but that we should be a part of Christ's rescue. The line of David that we see in Christ as we move into the Advent season, who is a part of the rescue and redemption of the world. I know today that it's easy for us to begin to think about this politically, but there are many other places and parts of life in which this is true. I'm thinking about it in regards to our life together as a church. I'm feeling a bit weakened, uh, struggling with the reality that today is the final day that we'll get a chance to worship with Andy Avram as one of our pastors. At the same time, though, I'm trusting the Lord to be with us, to guide us, and while I think of the ways in which I might become powerless by not having my partner in ministry who's preached with me all these years and who's served and led among this community as she has, I'm also recognizing that God will go before us. And that if we have been anything, we've been privileged in all of this. To be able to be gifted with a wonderful pastor, to be able to have one who represented beautifully women in ministry and encouraged us to be engaging in such a, a broadened understanding of what it means to be looking for those pastors among us, and one who's done it so very well. And for us as the people of God to recognize that we have been blessed with such a wonderful preacher, teacher, and pastor. As we move through today, it's going to feel a little bit odd. It's going to be strange because we will be walking through some lasts. But the Lord who brought pastor into our lives previously will continue to go with us and guide us. In fact, we believe then that Christ will feed us, will strengthen us, will be our shepherd, will be faithful in every step. As such, Christ will remain the King. Join me in worship then as we continue to celebrate the presence of God, as we continue to know that God is with us. Join me for a moment in prayer. O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your presence among us. O oh, God, may you guide us and direct us today to be a people of thanks in this season of thanks. While we recognize a number of things that are going wrong or more difficultly or, or, or whatever words we might choose, Lord, may we recognize that in the midst of it all, you've been there. You've been with us. You've abided with us. And we have an opportunity today as your people to worship you. Help us, O oh God, to be honest about places in which you need to grow us, places in which we have declared ourselves to be the weak, the, the ones struggling, the ones being picked on, when perhaps maybe we have ourselves assumed that your lordship meant that we got to then stand over other people as if we were somehow better than them. Help us, O oh God, to not be those kind of people. Help us instead to love, to be gentle and kind, to not lower our shoulder to take out someone next to us, but seeking to embrace them with the love of Christ. O oh Lord, we thank you for your Lordship that comes into town on a donkey as we declare in that moment before uh, Passion Week. And we ask, O oh God, that you would help us then to be a people who humble ourselves 
and who recognize the, the gift that there is of serving and loving and knowing in your name. O oh Lord, guide us and direct us then in worship, we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. fails me all my days I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God Of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend in the goodness of God
Who is God to you? Who is God to us? Is he boring? Old? Irrelevant? Is he real? Is he powerful? We tell ourselves, God is nothing more than words on a page. His power isn't real. He's small, weak, and insignificant. He doesn't understand my daily struggle. To us, he's absent, lifeless, dead. Is this truly God's character? Is he weak? Is he absent? Does God still exist? Is he real? God is more. He is more than a line or a passage. His power is not confined to words penned by man. It's real. From his mouth, the universe came to be. He is more than talk. He is action. He is by our side. He understands our pain, our struggle. Mere words cannot describe the warmth of his embrace or the shelter that he brings. He is more. Good morning. Please join me in a word of prayer. Father God, as I prepare to give this message, as we continue in our worship time together, I just ask that these not be my words, but the words that you inspire, that the power of the Holy Spirit be behind all that we are about to dive into. I want this text to sort of reach into each one of our lives and have the influence and power that it needs to have over our existence as it is today. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. So this morning we have a nearly perfect text, in my opinion, for my final Sunday as your associate pastor. We'll be reading Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. It is Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. In many ways, it echoes the prayers that we all have been praying this year, a year full of challenges. It is a prayer that reminds us of our belief in a powerful God. It is a passage that reminds us of our dependence and need for prayer, our need to pray for others and for others to pray for us. Power was a central theme throughout this epistle. Apparently that was because Ephesus itself was seen as a place of power. Not only was there great political power, it was the center of religious power as well. Various belief systems and cults flourished as people center their lives on that preservation of power and on the influence and value of power. The religious side of that included magic, wealth, and even an emphasis on bringing down one's enemies. So religion, or at least some of the practices associated with religion, had in a sense focused themselves on those selfish pursuits. But in the midst of all of this, the church in Ephesus was known as faithful and loving. They were faithful to God and they were loving to each other and to others outside of the church. What a great and inspirational reputation to have. This year in particular, I have found myself asking over and over what it means to be the church. Perhaps it is because we have seen so many examples lately as many have been speaking out on various issues. But we need to consider what it means to be known as those who are a loving and faithful people in the midst of all of the chaos and all of that noise around us. I have also been worried for the church and for my family and for myself as it feels as if more and more outside forces are succeeding in gaining some power and influence over us. The church in Ephesus were countercultural in that they were working as a church to be loving and faithful in the midst of those who were motivated by the very antithesis of those values. This is why, as we will soon read, Paul knew it was very important for them to be reminded of who was actually in power, who was on the throne. So let's read Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, and I'll be reading out of the Common English Bible. Since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, this is the reason that I don't stop giving thanks to God for you when I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that makes God known to you. I pray that the eyes of your heart will have had enough light to see what is the hope of God's call. What is the richness of God's glorious inheritance among believers? And what is the overwhelming greatness of God's power that is working among us believers? This power is conferred by the energy of God's powerful strength. 
God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sat him at God's right side in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power, any power that might be named not only now, but in the future. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him the head of everything in the church, which is his body. His body, the church, is the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Now for me, there are two parts that really jumped out of this text, both Paul's teaching on power and his prayers for the church of Ephesus. Additionally, I could not help but find myself very encouraged by this text. I am sure most would feel this way. It's a prayer for a church that has been faithful and loving, and therefore it certainly would be an encouragement. But it really was not just that. It was the reminder that the earthly powers have paled in comparison to the one who rose from the dead in Jesus. The text points out the ways in which God has placed Jesus, as it is written in the common English, far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power, any power that might be named not only now, but in the future. A huge statement that was worth repeating above every power then and now and in the future. Now, this is where I have to confess something. I actually wrote an entire sermon Thursday, was filming when I accidentally deleted the whole thing thinking I was deleting a video, not that the details of that matters. Anyway, at that moment, I had this thought, technology has far too much power over me in that moment, certainly. I was thinking that because this rather upsetting thing had happened, my sermon had been deleted, and I was fine with starting over actually, but I was just frustrated that I had made a mistake. No, and it wasn't just that. It was because when that happened, I immediately grabbed my phone. That's what I found concerning. That might seem normal to you, especially because I did need to text Pastor John and tell him I would not be sending the video when I had planned, but that wasn't why I grabbed my phone. It wasn't to Google, how do I find this document that I've accidentally deleted? I was taking a deep breath and distracting myself for a moment, and that was what I reached for. Without thinking, I had picked up that device and started playing music that I find calming while I breathed deeply and tried to recover this file. There's nothing wrong with that at all. This is a fine coping skill for stress. But when I gave that a little bit of thought, when I took yet another pause, it made me a bit sad, maybe even convicted. Not only did my laptop have power over me in that moment, I was giving even more attention to another device than I was anything else. That's when I knew I needed to physically step away and take time to pray. Now I'm here with a renewed appreciation for the prayer that Paul was offering up on behalf of the church of Ephesus. He prayed that they would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. He prayed that the Spirit would make God known to them, that they would understand and have hope in God's call. He prayed that they would be able to fully recognize the fullness of God's glory, greatness, energy, and strength. What more could we possibly ask for? Wisdom is that general knowledge that there is a God. Revelation is the function of the Holy Spirit that allows us to truly know and be known by God. Is there any other power or influence, teacher or entity that can do that? No. If there could be any theme given to all of the sermons that I have ever given at this church, it might be one of two things. First, that I've always sort of included an emphasis on knowing and being known by our creator, the one who designed us as image bearers and seeks to have relationship with us. Second, I often feel the need to share the value that the Lord has placed on each one of us equally, including women, and the roles that we play in the life of the church. Here, Paul's prayer includes one of those elements I find most foundational in our walk with the Lord. That first possible theme that is present for me throughout these sermons that I have had the pleasure of writing. Not only that we know He is God, but that it would be revealed to us in such a way 
that we know him intimately and understand that we too are known. This week, like so many this year, one of my close friends lost a woman who was like a sister to her to COVID. This woman was not yet 50 years old and she had children that were younger than mine and a husband who is of course devastated and lost. She was a woman of great faith. That friend also had lost a nephew early, earlier this year to cancer before he even turned 11. How do you pray for someone who has been so devastated? And what could I even do? I felt so helpless and lost as I read that another important person in her life had passed. So I prayed very simply that the God who knows her and loves her and is interested in her and knows her pain and is mourning with her would give her comfort beyond her understanding. I did not have to know anything other than that God knows her and is known to her, which brings us to hope. The text or the next part of the text in Paul's prayer was for the church in Ephesus to have an understanding of hope, hope in God's call. We may be struggling to find hope in the world around us, but our hope is not in the world, not in our earthly leaders, but in God. Our hope is in the one with ultimate power in our lives and in the world, not in those who have power or control over our country, our communities, our daily lives, even right now. These days, it is important that we follow the guidelines that the leaders are giving us, but it is even more important that we do not place our hope in them, but in God. Next, Paul wanted the church to fully comprehend the fullness of God's glory and overwhelming greatness, his energy and his strength. This has to be a prayer, a constant prayer that the Holy Spirit gives this gift to us because on our own, this is far too much for us to grasp. Without the help and the gift of the Holy Spirit, we would be incapable of seeing all that from our own perspectives. That is especially true if our perspectives are being shaped and influenced by things that are not of God. So our challenge, the challenge I lay before you is to consider what has power over you, what things are shaping your thoughts, your perspective, and the way you respond to others. Is it the God who raised Jesus from the grave, who has power over everything we can see, the one who is, has greatness that is absolutely overwhelming, or is it something else? Or is it many other things? Take time to think about that. Take time to pray the prayer that Paul has lifted up for the Ephesians, but apply it to this church, to your family, and to your own life. I will be doing the same. Now, before I pray, I want to say thank you once again for all that you have been to me and my family over the last seven and a half years. No other church has been our home for that long. You have watched my kids grow from awkward middle schoolers into awkward young adults. And many of you have had a great deal to do with that development and that the people that they have become. And I appreciate it so much. You've watched my husband um, as he was promoted to Colonel and more importantly, as he took on a role that blessed him greatly as the preschool Sunday school teacher. You've watched as I have gone from pastoral intern at my last church to an associate pastor and preaching partner here at Lowell First Church. You watched as I was ordained and have prayed for me all along the way, and I will continue to lift you up in my prayers as I go. It's the very least that I could do. I have loved my time here and will treasure it always. So please join me in prayer as we close. Father God, I thank you for this message that we have received. I thank you for this time that we have had in worship. I ask that you continue to give us that gift of wisdom and revelation. Father God, I hope that you can help us to really understand that overwhelming greatness so that we might be comforted and find hope far beyond even our own understanding. Please be with those who are hurting right now, those who are struggling, those who have lost their jobs, those who are struggling in this time that we have when COVID seems to be coming back in such a strong way, Lord. We know that you, Lord, are our hope. You are the one in which we place our faith. 
And Father God, even when we are so incredibly uncomfortable, we know that you are sitting on the throne and we thank you for that. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Thank you.